Well, welcome to Digging Deep Bible Study. Welcome, everybody. How are y'all doing? Welcome, everybody, online. And look at this crowd. I love it. Y'all keep showing up. This is wonderful. Thank y'all so much for being here. For those of you that don't know who I am, my name is David Reynolds, and I get to be the assistant care director here at Lone Star. And uh, are you ready this morning? Are you ready? I'm going to talk about the Lord's Word. So as Pastor Rob was just saying that I'm going to introduce this, this morning a, um, a parallel series we're going to do when Pastor Rob is out, and it's going to be called Lessons from a Judge. So we're going to be looking at the six major judges in the book of Judges, which are Othniel, Ehud, uh, Deborah with Barak, Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson, and then we're going to continue on to the last two that are in 1 Samuel, which were Eli and Samuel. And so judges were those anointed by God to lead Israel against their oppressors. They were the legal voices for the people and would guide the laws and ways of practical and godly living to restore and sustain faith and peace. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at their lives and we're going to be learning lessons from who they are and uh, what they did and applying them into our life today. And so today... I have the opportunity to introduce the very first judge of Israel, Othniel. Anybody ever heard of Othniel? And our, my, my, uh, my title for my message today is to be reliably reliable. To be reliably reliable. And you might be sitting there just wondering, what reliably reliable? Don't worry, we're going to get there. But I'd like for you to turn your Bibles to Judges chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. Again, that's Judges chapter 3, 7 to 11. And while you're getting there, I'm just going to go ahead and start off with a little story from my childhood. So when I was 12 years old, I had hit a lot of home runs, a lot of home runs in practice, in practice, not a game. And I'm going to tell you, for a couple of years there, I had done that. And it bothered me and bothered me and bothered me and it ate me up to where it got me ate up in my head and it got into my heart. To where then over time what happened was is I stopped practicing, as, I stopped practicing right, stopped practicing as hard. I was so focused on this and so focused on my personal achievement and what I wanted that I lost focus on being faithful to my team, being faithful to my coach and listening to my coach and doing the things that I was supposed to be faithful to, supposed to walk in and walk through so that we were successful as a team. And I'd lost focus on that. And so one day I was sour grapes and I'm sitting there and just weaned on pickle juice and I'm whining, 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 never hit a home run in a game. At this point, I'd also lost my position um, at batting third. I was batting fifth in the lineup. Everybody knows the coveted position of batting third is the best hitter on the team. And that really ate me up too. And my stepdad was sitting there and he said, you know what? If you would start focusing on the ball, if you'd start focusing on practicing right and what's in front of you, and stop worrying about all this other stuff, if you'd start honoring your coach and listening to him and walking through the instruction that he gives you, if you would start focusing on the goals of the team and looking at how and your place is on the team to make them better, he said two things are going to happen. One, you're going to end up getting that position back at batting third. He said the other thing, he said, son, when you least expect it, that ball is going to go over that fence in a game. <laughs> so I started practicing right. I got focused right again. I started focusing on my coach's instruction. I started focusing on every practice swing, every practice at bat, every ball that I hit. I started focusing on, on every play that I was making and the way I was practicing, the way I was being a teammate and a leader on the team. And I was focusing on the right things and the things that my coach had set out for us. And all of a sudden, I started hitting the ball more. And all of a sudden, I started knocking in more runs. And all of a sudden, I started making really good plays. And all of a sudden, we started doing better as a team. And then one day, I showed up to a game, and I looked up at that lineup on the dugout, and I was batting third again. 
<laughs> Thank you, Miss Ruth. But we were going up against a team that we never thought we could beat because they were better than us. And so I just remember, I went up to bat. It was the third or fourth inning. There was a runner on. We were losing one to nothing. I get up there and I was focused on just hitting the ball and doing what I needed to do. Sure enough, the pitcher winds up. He throws the ball. I hit that ball and I took off running because coach said, you don't watch the ball. You take off running. And I didn't even know it was gone until I rounded first base. Knocked it out of the park in my coach, and I could hear everybody. And I'm hitting second, and then I realize that I'm running. Oh, I can jog now. <laughs> I had rest and peace. But at the end of that game, by the way, we won that game. We beat that team two to one. But seeing all the joy in everybody and the fact that we won, it wasn't about my personal accolade of hitting that home run. It was the fact that we accomplished something together. And we were able to celebrate that together. Today, we're going to talk about faithfulness and what it means to be faithful to our coach. Really, it's even better. You ever hear about the coach's sons on the team always get to start? Well, we all get to be um, the coach's son and coach's daughter. He is our father in heaven. And we're going to focus on what it means that we're anointed and how to be faithful. So let us go to prayer. Just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe in the power of your word to change my life. Make me more like you through your word today. Your kingdom come, your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. So Othniel, anointed and faithful. Othniel was the first judge of Israel. And did you know that the name of Othniel meant, it's translated to lion of God. And what's interesting about that is who else it was the Lion of Judah? Jesus. Now, Othniel was from the tribe of Judah. Where was Jesus from? The tribe of Judah because he was of the house of David. And Othniel was from a faithful spiritual legacy of Caleb, his uncle. And so we can't, we can't talk about Othniel unless we step back and talk about Caleb, okay? Caleb was there. In Egypt before Pharaoh, when he saw Moses and Aaron come up and he saw God's power in bringing the plagues over Egypt, he was there and saw it. He was there and had to wipe the posts of his home with the lamb, lamb's blood. He had to make that march and flee from Pharaoh. He was there when he saw the power of God open up the Red Sea as they were able to cross, he crossed the Red Sea and got to turn back and see the Pharaoh's army get squashed in the middle of that. So then they go out in the wilderness, some time passed, and it was time that God told Moses to send out a spy from each of the 12 tribes of Israel to go out in the land for 40 days into Canaan, into the promised land to spy it out to bring back reports and to also bring back the fruit of the land. So if you remember what happened, 10 of them came back and was like, man, they're just a bunch of big armies. We just can't do this. This is, this is crazy. This is outrageous. And the people turned against and started to rebel. And you brought us out here in the wilderness. Rah, 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 rah. Lost faith. And there's Joshua and Caleb. And they fell to their faces and they pleaded with the people. Did you not see that God promised us this land? And did we not experience his power that he's delivered us out of Egypt? And he promised this to us and now it is ours to take. And look, it flows with milk and honey, just as God said. But the people rebelled anyway. That generation would never see the promised land and they would have to go through the wilderness for 40 years. However, there was a promise made of Caleb. Caleb would get to see it and Joshua would get to see it because they were what? They were faithful. They were faithful and they believed in their mighty God. So then when the time came, they, Caleb was promised 
Moses was, was told by God that Caleb, that Caleb would receive his land of Judah. So when it came time, as they came in and they had the conquest 40 years later, and it was time to divvy out the lands, Caleb went to Joshua and said, remember what God told Moses? And I want that land and I know that land and I, we still got to conquer people in our lands and I'm going to go and I'm going to conquer them. He was going to be faithful. So during this time, after conquering much of the promised land, the tribe of Judah was highly successful under Caleb. And this is where we first learn of Othniel because Othniel was his nephew. So he was raised up in this faith, faith and hearing about the power of God in knowing because of what he saw and how he was led to be. So we read in Judges 1, 11 through 13, from there they went against the inhabitants of Debir. The name of Debir was formerly Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, he who attacks Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will give him Aksa, my daughter, for a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, for a wife. Israel, however, had collectively failed to complete the conquest. And therefore, they as a people of Israel did not fulfill their side of the covenant of the promised land that God had made with them. And then an angel appeared to them saying, in Judges 2, you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? You have not obeyed. You have not been faithful. What is this that you have done? So now I say I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. So Joshua then died, and the people of Israel began doing what? They began to worship the pagan gods of the land and they abandoned God in their apostasy. So God allowed Israel to be conquered. And this is the time that he would rise up a faithful one, Othniel. So now we get to Judges 3 verses 7 to 11. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asheroth. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. Say that ten times fast. So the land had rest, had what? Had rest, peace for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. So the people were oppressed under Mesopotamian rule for eight years. Okay, now for us that read the Bible, we see this is the first time in this cycle that they're going to go over and over again through this cycle of walking away from God, God rising up, someone to lead them, a judge, and then turning back to God. And we just turn into this endless cycle and I always think about how often in my life do I go through this cycle? But am I looking to it for my good and being faithful in it so that he can sanctify me further? But what I want to talk about right now is I want to go back and I want to talk about a story of Moses, okay? Now you remember many years earlier, before Moses went to Midian and he came back and delivered the people, Moses was out and all of a sudden, there's this Egyptian, and he is whipping and beating this Hebrew. And what did Moses do? Moses decided, oh, I'm going to stand up. I can't take it anymore right now. And he didn't just hurt the Egyptian or remove the Egyptian. He killed the Egyptian. Now, what's interesting is soon after that, as he's moving through, he sees two Hebrews quarreling. The Hebrews see him 
And one of them says, are you going to kill us, one of us too? Which is interesting. Why am I bringing this up? I want to talk about our culture today. In our culture today, I truly believe because I can say it for myself and because what I see when I look at our country and I look at our Western culture, I truly believe, and maybe you can agree with me, that if we were standing there and saw Moses kill that guy beating him, yeah, we'd feel justified, right? He saved that guy. He's standing up for us, right? That's, I just see that in our culture. We, we cancel everybody. You turn on the news, it's all, if, 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 you, if, you look at a, if you look at a political debate, everybody's throwing mud at one another. Everybody wants to kill the other one because I've got it right under my power, under what I'm going to do. We can't live in this uncomfortableness. We got to fix everything. I just see it in our culture. I think that we would be like, yeah. But doing a good thing outside of God's will Doing a good thing outside of God's will and outside of God's timing is never the right thing. Even if there is continued suffering, it's a tough pill to swallow. Even if there's pain, there's persecution, we are uncomfortable. We lack understanding. Because guess what? They had to spend, once he took off, when Moses took off, those people had to spend another 40 years under that hardship of before God was going to deliver them through who? Moses, that same guy. But what was different? Timing, will. We just read with Othniel, when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord who? The Lord who? The Lord raised up a deliverer, not a man, not a king, no, the Lord. God waited for the hearts of the people to turn back to him. Before he would rise up a godly leader, they would listen to and follow. A godly leader could never lead an ungodly people. They wouldn't listen. This is why, hang on with me, this is why we often do not hear God when we are living life separated from him. It's not that he's not there but we're not looking for him and focused on him. If we choose sin, if we choose Mesopotamia, if we choose the Baals and the Asherah, we will allow sin to rule over us. He, God will allow sin to rule over us. If we choose Jesus, what does Jesus do? He redeems us and he says, come follow me. So remember in Acts 1, I'm gonna take you to another story. In Acts 1, Peter stood up and he spoke that they needed to replace Judas as a new apostle. They needed that 12th. They were actually told they were going to need that. And Peter stands up, hey, we need this. But what did they do? They proceeded to give God two choices. They gave God choices, Joseph and Matthias. They prayed to God for which one he would choose, so they were good Christians, and they prayed to God, okay, Lord, which one are you going to choose, even though we gave them to you? <laughs> but then they placed their faith in casting lots. They went back to their worldly ways and the way they did it. So Matthias was chosen, but was Matthias chosen by God? No. How many times in our lives? I'm preaching to me today. I'm preaching to me today. How many times do we give God the solutions to choose from rather than ask God to give us the solutions? How often do we submit to God's timing? Are we willing to stay in an uncomfortable situation or suffer as we wait for God's timing, God's solutions, God's will? Are we willing to do that? I tell you all, this is really hard. I, I'm working through this as I was putting this together and the Lord was just hammering me. I want to say something because this is something that God gave to me. We will only ever reach as far as our own abilities unless we reach for God's abilities. Faith 
You want more faith? Faith is built in the one you reach for the most. Okay, David, so we got away from Othniel. What does this have to do with Othniel? Do you think that Othniel was raised up by the Lord because he was not a faithful servant of him? Othniel was raised up because he came from that legacy. He knew the power of God. He was walking faithfully and he was chosen. So we're gonna talk about that. One, he believed and two, he was faithful. So where can we find, there's lots of places we can find believe and faithful in scripture, but let's break this down. In John 6, 28 to 29, you remember I even taught on this last year. Jesus fed the 5,000. He walked on water that night. He comes back, the people are looking for him, okay? So in talking about the, working, the, the works of God, the people asked him, what is that? So in 28 and 29, they said, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. Now we throw around this word belief all the time, but the Greek word for belief here, to, for belief is pistuo. And the definition of that word, yes, to be persuaded of, place confidence in, to trust. We're not talking about just mere, yeah, I believe Jesus. I believe he, I just believe that. No, to put trust in, and it's all summed up into this, reliance upon, reliance upon him. Our belief has to do, it's further than just a mere, I believe in you. It's relying upon him. Then we look to 1 Timothy. Let's, let's stay with me. Let's look at the word faithful. In 1 Timothy 1.12, Paul said when he's talking to Timothy, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me, what? He judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. And what's interesting when you look at the Greek word for faithful, now what was believed? It was pistuo. The Greek word for faithful is pistos. It's the adjective verb form. It means to be trusted in what? Reliable. So we have to be reliably reliable on him as we walk out our salvation, as we work out this work of God to believe. When we look at the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, 21 and 23, it says, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, so I will do what? I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. I hope all of us hear those. I think every one of us is going to hear those words one day when we enter heaven. Amen. So to be reliably reliable on God, not just relying him for monetary needs or I'm in this uncomfortable situation. Take me out of it, Lord. Or not just those things, not just provisions, but relying upon him for the ways we should go. Psalm 143, 8, for his plans in our lives. Jeremiah 29, 11, for the days that he formed for us. Psalm 139, 16, be reliable in being obedient to his instruction and using the gifts that he gives us to multiply his kingdom. Now, every Christian, meaning all believers and everybody here, one, has been redeemed by the blood of Christ. Two, become a new creation, born again, resurrected in Christ. Three, has been anointed, anointed. Say, I'm anointed. Say, I'm anointed by the Holy Spirit as the temple of Christ. And therefore, anointed as what? Because he is the light of the world, we are anointed as the light of the world. In Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. Who prepared beforehand? God. That who should walk in them? We should walk in them. That is our responsibility, just like they had their responsibility then to do what God had for them. Our responsibility is the good works for which God prepared beforehand. But what, do, what are those things? Being anointed does not mean our plans in our ways just become blessed as God's ways. Being anointed comes with the responsibility of being faithful to asking for God's plans, looking for his plans, listening for his plans, and then taking the responsibility and being what? Faithful, walking in them. So let's quickly look at some examples of anointing versus faithfulness. And then we'll get back a little bit to Othniel and don't worry. <laughs> Let's look at three kings. Absalom, Saul, and David. Any of you know who Absalom was? Absalom was the third son of King David. What happened with Absalom? I want you to kind of put yourself in this situation here as I read this. A lot of things were not going right and needed to be fixed in the kingdom. A lot of things. And Absalom was going to get things done right. Because we can't have that. Were there problems? Yeah, there were problems in the kingdom. Are there problems in our church? Are there problems in our country? Are there problems at our place of work? Are there problems in our homes? The problems in our families. But with these problems that were going on in the kingdom where there was an anointed king, David, it didn't matter to Absalom, right? Certainly God could not stand by these problems, so something has to be done about it. Right? Something's got to be done, right? Don't we feel that way sometimes? I feel that way sometimes. Oh, I... Over a four-year period, Absalom stole the hearts of the people. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a problem. This is what I would do. This is how I'd fix it. Yeah, 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 David. I mean, yeah, Absalom. Yeah, Absalom. Yeah, this is how I'd fix it for four years. Now he's got his little posse, right? Absalom stole the hearts of the people, and eventually he was anointed by who? The people, not God. He went down and he was anointed. He, was, he, was, he had it set up to be crowned. Now, hey, if a lot of religious people are behind him, it must be what God had wanted, right? You ever thought about that? Well, a lot of godly people are telling me, so it must be right. Hmm. Food for thought today, guys. He had himself crowned at Hebron and attempted to usurp King David's throne by military force, his father, and sent them to Jerusalem. Now, David had since fleed because he decided he wasn't going to be, and we're going to talk about Saul in a second, but he wasn't going to go after his son. And he asked the generals to be gentle with Absalom because he knew they were going to get him. Now, you can't make this up. Humor in all of this. Absalom is riding on his horse with his beautiful locks. And they get stuck in the branches of a tree. I kid you not. The horse keeps going. There he is off of his horse hanging midair. And Joab doesn't listen to David and he kills him. But here's, here's what happened. Y'all see the picture of what Absalom did? Are we an Absalom? I have to ask myself, am I an Absalom? Is that being faithful? Is that being faithful to the ones that have been anointed over us? No. Let's talk about King Saul. King Saul, was he anointed? He was anointed. He was anointed the first king over Israel. They wanted a king. They gave him a king. They gave him King Saul. But King Saul was consistently disobedient to God. As we see even before the battles that he wasn't completely obedient with, he was supposed to wait. He was supposed to wait for Samuel 
for the offering to be made, the burnt offering to be made. And he couldn't wait anymore. He couldn't wait. Something's got to be done. He's not showing up yet. Oh, I'm going to take it in my own hands and I'm going to go and I'm going to do it myself. Was that a problem? Was it God's timing? Was it what God had instituted? Is what he had said? Now he would go on in these battles and he would go against what God said. We kind of know the story. Those of you who know the story, they were supposed to slaughter everything in battle. He kept all the best of everything. And he even tells Samuel, it was basically so he could win the hearts of the people, so he could win the hearts of the people. Now, what's interesting is, is if a leader isn't faithful, how can the people be faithful? So what do you think happened when Goliath showed up? Did anybody stand up against Goliath, including Saul? Did anybody in his, under his leadership stand up against him? What about that faithfulness? What about that understanding and believing in the power of God? However, God's anointed would show up in a young boy, David. So let's talk about him real quick. David was anointed by God to be king, but he had to run for his life for 14 years from Saul because guess what Saul also did? There's another one that's supposed to rise up over me. I can't handle that. I'm gonna be self-fulfilling. Absalom was self-fulfilling. I'm gonna get things done right and this is what we need to do, not what God has to do. Saul, self-fulfilling, not God-fulfilling. And I'm going to take out this person that even God anointed. I'm going to go that far. And he chased him for 14 years into caves. So David had to run. But I wanted, this is the key to David, okay? Because this is part of Judah. Othniel came from Judah. David is years later from the tribe of Judah. What did David do? David had the hearts of the people from battles. That's why Saul couldn't stand him. They sung great song and, and lifted David up above Saul. He had the hearts of the people like who? Like his son later, Absalom. But when he fled and he took off from Saul, he didn't stand up against Saul and take all these people and go against the anointed one that, that who Saul was, right? He didn't do that. Did he take a whole bunch of people with him when he ran? No, he didn't. He took himself outside from under that authority and he went alone. He didn't go up against God's plans and he waited and he had chances to kill Saul and did he? He did not. He looked to the Lord's plans. He was faithful to the Lord. And so what we have to do like Othniel being faithful in rising up to deliver the people under the hand of God, to be faithful to him. When we are faithful to him, that's where he's going to bring that peace over our land and our lives. We got to ask ourselves, are we an Absalom? Are we a Saul? Or are we a David? Are we an Othniel? Are we an Othniel where we are planted and faithful? So now going back to Othniel, it said the Lord raised up a deliverer. Who raised up? For the people of Israel who saved them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The spirit of the Lord was upon him, meaning because of that, he was anointed. We all just went through that. We have the Holy Spirit with us as sons and daughters of the Lord Most High, as the temple of Jesus Christ, as the light of the world. We are anointed. So we have that responsibility. And he judged Israel. He went out to war. And who gave Kushan Rishathim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand? The Lord, thank you. And his hand prevailed over Kushan Rishathaim. So the land had rest for 40 years. The land had rest, not just the people. No plagues, no sicknesses, no droughts, no threats, peace. I wonder how many years of rest we have lost because we have not asked for the ways we should go. His plans for our lives, the days that he formed for us, those good works that God prepared for us beforehand. So we have four steps here that we went through and I'm gonna break them down right now as we wrap up. 
we have to rely on him and ask for those things. Okay, we have to rely. We gotta be reliably reliable. We have to rely on him and ask for them. Number two, we have to patiently wait, even if it hurts. We have to patiently wait. And then we have to be receptive to the answers that he gives. And guess what? So often, he's not going to give an answer that our flesh is looking for. We don't need to be going and casting lots like we were talking about Peter and them when they were looking to replace Judas with Matthias. We have to receive the answer he gives and then we have to be humbly obedient and do what, as we read in scripture, walk in them. So Othniel was anointed to lead because he was what? Faithful, faithful, very good. He was reliably reliable on God. He waited for God's appointed time, eight years. That probably was pretty hard. Because of his faithfulness, the Lord gave him victory in battle. And through faithfulness, guys, you want peace? I want peace. Raise your hand if you want peace. And through faithfulness, peace, peace is born. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for your word today. We thank you for teaching us through your son, Othniel, the first king of, of Israel. We're just so thankful that we get to serve the Lord and God of Othniel, that you're the God of old, the God of new. We thank you for what you've done and what you're doing now and what you're going to do. And Lord, I just pray for a blessing over everyone here, me included, everyone online, that you will help us to plug into you and to ask for these ways that we should go and these plans that you have for us and these days that you form for us and these works that you have made for us that we had asked for them that we humbly receive those things from you lord jesus and then we will be faithful faithful like othniel faithful like david walk in them so that there is peace brought among us and that we're able to lead one another in Christ and to be the light of the world. We thank you, Lord. We praise your most holy name, Jesus, all in your name. Amen.